I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, in the ongoing series of the peripheral people about my old friend, one of my best friends, James Longstreet. He's got quite the story that I suspect many of you really have little to no idea about who and what Pete Longstreet was. He was born, his story begins on January the 8th of 1821. He was born in South Carolina in the Edgefield district. I know not where that is, but he was really proud of it. And to the uh, aristocracy of South Carolina, the early aristocracy, because Pete never uh, acquired the gentrification and the manners of the what later became the Southern aristocracy. He was uh, at the academy, in fact, described as being coarse in language and rough in his appearance and uh, got a lot of demerits for his hair being too long, being unkempt. He really did not like being at the academy. Of course, neither did I. So we got along famously on that account. But he was born in Edgefield, South Carolina, 1821. And when he was about, and he's the third of six children. When he was about nine years old, uh, his father decided that <clears throat> Pete should have a military education. I don't know if that's gonna help or not. Uh, oh, you're talking about here. Ah. All right. Can you hear me here in the room better? Ah, good. So Pete had his future determined by his father, uh, a wealthy planner, that he was going to have a military education. And he the, the schools in the Edgefield district, his father felt, were not good enough. So he sent Pete to live with his brother, Uncle Pete's uncle Gus, who was a businessman a distillery owner and producer, a politician of some great note elected to office and also a Methodist minister. Uh, I expect all those combined in one man, but he did all those things. And he was a classically read individual, widely read individual. And Pete got to sit at the knee of a very intelligent and educated man. And uh, he spent the next eight years there. Uh, in 1833, Pete's father visited uh, Augusta, Georgia, where the uncle lived, and died, uh, got carried off in a cholera epidemic. And uh, at that time, Pete's mother, Ann Dent, that is key for later, his mother, Ann Dent, from Maryland, then moved with the three children, four children at that time to Somerville, Alabama and took up residence there. So Pete stays in Augusta, Georgia, mother moves to Alabama and Pete continues to go to school. Well, come 1838 uh, and <clears throat> the uncle, Uncle Gus, uh, who also I should say at this point was a firm, vehement believer in states' rights. He was not in favor so much of slavery as he was of states' rights, the independence of states not to be controlled by a central government. And that's where I suspect Pete picked it up uh, because he firmly held that belief as well. But the attempt was made to get Pete into the United States Military Academy. He really didn't want to go. The first uh, uh, representative that uh, was contacted to appoint Pete, well, he'd already appointed somebody. So they went to uh, their second choice, another congressman from Alabama, because that's where Pete's mother had removed to and was now a citizen of Alabama uh, on a plantation they owned down there. In fact, she and her husband had owned several plantations. So Pete gets an appointment to the United States Military Academy, class of 1842 to begin in the summer of 1838 from Alabama. He went to the academy and did not like it. Uh, he, he didn't care for the academics a whit. 
In fact, he said all the geometry and the mathematics and the classics and the French and the English literature are all so much bunkum. I like the military application, which as I've told you in the past, West Point, when we went there, had very little military instruction. It was primarily a classical education with heavy engineering application. And beyond that, oh, just a, a tad of military application, artillery instruction, musket drill, manual of arms, and uh, cavalry. But Pete also studied under Dennis Hart Mahon, the great Mahon, one of the great Mahons. And Mahon was a strong believer in defensive tactics, defensive offense. He emphasized to muster your forces and hit the enemy's weakest point as you perceived it and hit them hard and was emphatic in his theory of military application and what he was teaching those cadets, future officers, all of, of us fighting in the war against each other. Uh, the defensive approach, an aggressive defensive approach. And that sounds like an oxymoron, but it works well if you know what you are doing in the field. And Pete Longstreet clearly demonstrated he knew what he was doing. That's why he had some difficulty with Lee at Gettysburg, but more about that in a moment. He uh, was uh, heavily demerited for cursing the hair, the uh, unkempt clothing, uh, and he made it pretty clear, I don't want to be here. And also, if you really don't want me here, you know what you can do. Uh, but nobody ever took him up on it. And lo, it came to pass, he graduated in the class of 1842, one year ahead of me in 1843. And we had met, we, we knew each other well for the three years that we were there together. And we became really good friends. Uh, I think a lot of Pete. And uh, as I've said before in our comings together, uh, when I entered the academy, I was 5'1 and weighed 117 pounds. Pete Longstreet was 6'2 and weighed 200 pounds. I looked like a monkey next to a mastiff when we stood together. And uh, there was one particular incident that I will go in no further than to say somebody was attempting to give me a bad time. And while he was attempting to give me a bad time, I, uh, I was about to pummel him when a shadow behind me fell across the face of this other cadet and the other cadet's attitude changed radically. And uh, Pete Longstreet said, do we have a problem here? And the other cadet said, uh, no, no, we don't, uh, Cadet Longstreet. It looks like we have a problem here. Do you want more of a problem than what you have? And the other cadet said, no, I do not, Cadet Longstreet. And he removed himself from the area, never to trifle with me again. And we, uh, we just got along famously, became the best of friends. When he graduated, he went to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. And he was there for two years. He'd been there a year when I got there out of the class of 1843. Now, I know it may seem hard to believe, but Lieutenant Colonel Garland was commanding Jefferson Barracks. And he had a very, very pretty daughter, Louisa, that everybody, everybody called Louise. So Longstreet began squiring the daughter of the commanding officer of the post. And uh, when I got there, he'd had a relationship with her, a courtship for some months. And when I arrived at Jefferson Barracks in the uh, late summer of 1843, I went out to the Dent home. Remember, Pete Longstreet's mother's maiden name was Dent from Maryland. Well, Colonel Dent and Ellen Dent, the parents of Julia Dent, had removed from Maryland to St. Louis. And I began seeing Julia Dent. So 
as it came to pass, we both shipped out for the Mexican War. And uh, we had both committed to our respective sweethearts. And uh, uh, Louise had agreed to marry Pete when he came back. And Julia, after I'd overcome her father, saying he ain't ever going to amount to nothing, comment. Uh, and saying I, I didn't raise my daughter to marry an Army officer, comment. Uh, Julia agreed to marry me and uh, wore my class ring. We both went to Mexico. Well, we both fought and scrapped all over Mexico. I was in every battle in the Mexican War except Buena Vista, and I missed that because I was transferring from General Taylor in the South to General Scott in the North. Pete stayed in the South to General Taylor and was badly wounded at the Battle of Chapultepec, which is the battle that caused the fall of Mexico City and ultimately the end of the war when Santa Ana surrendered. But he was uh, the flag bearer as they were charging up a very steep hill in embankment, in, in, in placement. Flag bearer was shot and killed and uh, Pete grabbed the, the colors and went on up the hill. And then he got hit in the left leg in the thigh and it knocked him off his feet. George Pickett uh, was behind Pete and grabbed the colors before they fell and carried them on up the hill. So Pete was pretty badly injured. He nearly lost a leg. And he was in the Redondo family, a uh, Spanish family there in the area, who cared for American, wounded American soldiers. So Pete stayed there until December of uh, 47 and uh, 48, and then he went home to St. Louis and he promptly married Louise Walcott. And uh, they promptly began having children. They had 10. Uh, and I got back and married Julia and we promptly began having children. And I had the one and then the two before I shipped out to go to the Oregon territory. Pete went to Texas and was down there fighting Comanches in Texas and doing escort for settlers coming in. He moved uh, to Fort Bliss I think in San Antonio, was uh, near San Antonio. Louise and the now growing family, uh, rapidly growing family, moved to San Antonio where they were close. Then uh, Pete requested to be reassigned to the, east, uh, to the cavalry because he was only making $40 a month and he couldn't feed his family. That was denied, and they made him the quartermaster of the 8th Texas Regiment. Uh, he took his son Garland back to uh, New York to have him go to school, and then comes back to Texas. They sent him to Fort Leavenworth and uh, outside the prison, not in. And he was the quartermaster running the 8th Infantry. It was really boring. He's had some really descriptive uh, statements about how boring the job was, which I will spare you. I wish he'd spared me, but uh, he, he did the same thing. There was a parallel. Pete Longstreet had to do all of the logistics for the 8th United States Army Regiment. And even though it was neck deep in paperwork, Pete learned how to equip and feed a large force of men in the field. And it served as it did me that experience served him well in the war that was to come. So war starts and Pete uh, resigns his commission. He was in Leavenworth. Several officers there went south with Pete and uh, he reported, he, he got the commission of Lieutenant Colonel. He'd made major regular army, United States Army. So he was a major and was offered uh, better ranking if he stayed with the uh, United States, he declined and uh, went to uh, Richmond. Jefferson Davis, when he arrived, he'd been given a lieutenant colonel rank. When Jefferson Davis met him, uh, Lee, Lee was with him and they immediately made him a brigadier general uh, from Alabama. The militia, because remember, mother lives in Alabama. His West Point appointment was from Alabama. When he graduated, 56 out of 62. Uh, as I said now, he, he's a really smart man. He just didn't want to be in school there, but 56 out of 62 in his class. Uh, and then in October of, and he fought at Bull Run, 
and was furious because as federal forces were retreating, he, his men from Alabama were running the, the, the Yanks all the way back to Washington City, and he was ordered to stop. He had, he had to hold his tongue for the commanding officer who outranked him, uh, who'd ordered don't pursue anymore, but he was at Bull Run. And then uh, in October of 62, he's appointed a major general. He's with Lee in the Eastern Theater, and he really didn't get along with Robert E. Lee as early as uh, late winter of 1862. Because remember, I said he was a believer in offensive, defensive tactics. Don't sit on your hands and wait and dig in and wait for the enemy to come to you, but be well prepared, well dug in. And when you have the opportunity, be like that frog tongue reach out and get that fly before the fly knows what hits him. And that's the way Pete Longstreet liked to fight. But he was more defensive than aggressive. Now he's on the bubble there, but a little more defensive than aggressive. Robert E. Lee was aggressive. And see, Lee and myself have that parallel. If you gave either one of us an op three or four options in any combat situation, if one of them was attacked, that's the one we picked. Longstreet disagreed with Lee on that, and as early as late fall of 1862, he'd written a letter to Secretary of War Seddon in the Confederate cabinet saying, I'd really be better served in the Western theater. So when you hear all that bunkum about it's his fault that the uh, Confederates lost Gettysburg and it's his fault the Confederates lost the war, that is pure romance because Longstreet and Lee had a fundamental disagreement about how to conduct war. And after Gettysburg, of course, we, we know about Gettysburg uh, and the controversial, uh, let's go around the Federals and hit them from the rear. Let's don't attack, send Pickett's regiment across that open field for a mile and a quarter under heavy fire. Uh, and he told Lee, when Lee said hit, hit them, he told Lee, he said, General, I've been a soldier all my life. I have fought singly. I have fought in pairs. I fought in squads. I fought in companies, platoons, regiments, divisions, and even entire armies. And General, I will tell you, sir, there is not an, an army I have ever seen that can take that position. And Lee said, they are there and I will fight them. Give the order. Longstreet dallied a bit because he simply did not want to send Pickett across that field. And Lee wanted Pickett in place to attack at dawn, first daylight. They weren't there because Longstreet hadn't given the order. Well, Lee had to rearrange all of his plans and do a later attack. Same men, same open field, same federal artillery uh, across an open killing field and Longstreet said, don't do this. And Lee said, give that order. So Longstreet, he never actually said it. Uh, Pickett said, are we ready to go, sir? And Longstreet just nodded his head and pulled his horse away and rode away from Pickett's men marching, emerging out of those woods. After the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloodbath that it was, Longstreet again wrote a letter to uh, President Davis, Jefferson Davis, requesting an assignment to the Western Theater, saying that, that uh, God help us if we continue to fight the war as we are fighting it. Lee is shedding blood everywhere all over the South and doing it unnecessarily. I, mm -hmm. And I want to get away from it. Well, at about this time in the Western Theater, when all the machinations are going on in Virginia, and Pennsylvania, South Pennsylvania, Maryland, Gettysburg. Uh, Bragg has gotten Rosecrans, Bragg's with the Army of Tennessee, not the Tennessee, Federal's Army of the Tennessee, Confederates are Army of Tennessee. And Bragg has got William Rosecrans. He whipped him all over Chickamauga Creek, ran him back into Chattanooga, and Rosecrans sits on his haunches and lets his men starve for the next month, six weeks. Uh, Jefferson Davis sent Longstreet 
with two divisions, a core, uh, and two divisions, I believe, to uh, Bragg. Now, Bragg said, I don't think it can be done. The Secretary of War said, and for the Confederacy said, it can't be done, but Longstreet did it. Over uh, 17 days, his men moved over 716 miles, 784 miles on 16 different railroads and got into Eastern Tennessee, right between Middle and Eastern Tennessee at Chattanooga and did it, I think, in 17 days. It's one of the greatest movements of any army to that date in history, and I don't know that that will ever be uh, exceeded. 784 miles, 16 different railroads, moved a division, a corps in two divisions. Incredible effort. He got there on the night of the first day of Chickamauga. It had not gone well for the Federals, and one uh, Rosecrans had snarled at one of uh, a General Wood uh, in the line, the defensive line for the Federals there along Chickamauga Creek, and uh, said something to the effect of him, well, if I want the same thing Alex said to me, if I want your advice, I'll ask you for it. You do what I tell you to do, and you wait for your, follow your orders. So the next day, on the second day, we got James Longstreet, Lee's old war horse, and he's got a fresh army. He's got tens of thousands of men in a fresh army, and they are spoiling for the proverbial fight. Well, in the lineup along Snodgrass Hill and running into Chickamauga Creek, there's a wide open field. Federal lines are there, and General Wood, who'd been snarled at the day before by Rosecrans, moves to the, uh, had been told to move to, I think, his right. And when he did that, he opened a quarter mile wide gap in the federal line. Well, he's brought, that is brought to his attention. General Wood, do you not think that you should move and, and fill this gap? And he said, when General Rosecrans orders me to move and fill that gap, I will move and I will fill that gap. But until I get orders from General Rosecrans, I'm staying right here. So that kind of you know, that kind of leadership, snapping and snarling at your subordinates, and the subordinate having that passive aggressive, well, if he wants me, he can call me. And, <clears throat> and that quarter mile opening, Longstreet, of course, saw it. And he poured thousands of rib troops through that opening. And parted our lines, and that was all it took. Rosecrans and most of the army skedaddled back into Chattanooga some eight or 10 miles away as fast as their legs could carry them, and uh, George Thomas held Snodgrass Hill. Well, when, Bra when uh, Longstreet had gotten to Bragg, uh, he was all right with Bragg, but he quickly came to despise Bragg. In fact, the cabal of Confederate officers that sent telegram to Jefferson Davis saying, you got to remove this man. We, we can't fight under him. Uh, and Longstreet sent another telegram. He said, God help us if we keep bragging command. There's no way that we can win a war fighting under this man. He is not fit for command. Jefferson Davis comes down and has a meeting and has Bragg sit there next to him and starting with Longstreet to the most junior officer, he had every one of them who'd complained about General Bragg to sit there and tell him in front of General Bragg what was the problem. And every one of them said, he's not fit for command. He's killing men unnecessarily. He needs to be replaced. And just one after the other. When the meeting is over, Jefferson Davis does nothing. He leaves Bragg in command and goes back to Richmond to sit in the Confederate White House. Bragg turns around and sends Longstreet to uh, attack General Burnside in Knoxville, Tennessee, 100 miles away. Burnside has come down with the Ninth Corps to take uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, Bill's Fort Sanders. And uh, Bragg is so uh, disgusted with Longstreet uh, and Longstreet is so livid with him that he says, go up to Knoxville, 100 miles northeast, and uh, attack Burnside. And Longstreet said, I would have been gone yesterday if I could have. 
So he takes his thousands of men and marches up to Knoxville as a miserable defeat at Fort Sanders. It's a slaughter. And he has to, uh, to go into winter quarters at Rogersville, Tennessee, the coldest winter on record in Tennessee. His men, half of them were barefoot. They were starving. Many of them died from exposure. And after uh, the spring broke, Longstreet returned to Lee. And uh, so when I got to Chattanooga uh, on October 23rd, Longstreet gets sent up to uh, attack Burnside. Bragg doesn't have Longstreet and those veterans in his corps. I build a cracker line. We take Lookout Mountain. We take Missionary Ridge and kick Bragg down into uh, North Georgia. See, Bragg made a really bad mistake sending Pete Longstreet away right at the time I got to Chattanooga and he didn't have Longstreet's help. Longstreet then goes back to join Lee uh, and he gets back to, he finally gets back into the Eastern Theater, which is essentially Virginia. And then May the uh, 3rd and 4th, I moved 115,000 troops across the Rapidan River on across seven different bridges. And I, Lee attacked me on the, the 5th and 6th in the wilderness. Lee is working at a handicap because I've got 115,000 men. He has about 80,000. And contrary to myth and legend, the wilderness was no benefit to Lee. Fighting in the wilderness was just as hard for Lee as it was for me. He's waiting for Longstreet. Longstreet's trying to get there. And he finally, on the afternoon of May the 6th, second day of the Battle of the Wilderness, and he brings his corps in and engages with my corps and forces pushing through the wilderness towards Spotsylvania Courthouse. Longstreet is shot by friendly fire. He is shot, uh, nearly killed him. Bullet went into his neck and through his shoulder, severed nerves in his shoulder, and his arm, his left arm was virtually useless the rest of his life. It took out uh, part of his vocal cords and uh, hit two or three other times with minor wounds, and it uh, nearly carried him off. So right there at the peak of the combat of the second day, Lee loses his old war horse. And Pete goes back down to Augusta, Georgia and does not come back into action until the following October of 64 uh, when he rejoins Lee. I sent a message as soon as I got notice that Longstreet had been hit. And I'd like to point out, Longstreet was hit by friendly fire one mile from where Stonewall Jackson had been killed by his own men almost a year to the day before. Uh, apparently it's a very deadly place, a mile away from where Jackson was killed and a year almost to the day when Jackson was killed, both men by friendly fire. But I, I sent a note to General Lee that said, uh, inquiring as to Longstreet's condition and expressing my concern and said, if need be, I, I shall send my own physician. Uh, if, if you will allow, I will send my own physician to treat uh, General Longstreet. General Lee thanked me very politely and said, no, sir, we have more than adequate surgeons who are treating General Longstreet. He is alive and well. He's conscious, uh, but he, he should uh, be all right. These are apparently are not life-threatening wounds. And then he got on the train, went back to Augusta, Georgia. Uh, but he rejoined in November, just in time to get involved at the end of the Petersburg siege and campaign, and uh, was there at the end. Now, when General Lee told uh, him on the morning of April the 9th, 65, that he, I said, I've got to go see General Grant. Longstreet said, General Grant will give you good terms, generous terms. And as Lee was walking out the door, he said, but if he does not give you good turns, immediately end the interview general and tell him the responsibility will be his, come on. But Lee surrendered, war is over. 
at the end of the war, at the, at the, uh, after the surrender, when I walked out into the, the McLean court uh, front yard, Longstreet was there. I ran to him and embraced him, pumped his hand and said, come Pete, let us play a game of brag. It's a card game. Let's play a game of brag and talk about the old times. And Longstreet later wrote, it was as if nothing had ever happened between the last time we saw each other in St. Louis in 58, and the McLean house after four years of war in uh, the front yard after the surrender. But he went down to New Orleans. He got involved in the cotton brokerage business, uh, got involved in banking. He got involved in insurance. All those former Confederate generals got involved in insurance companies. None of them worked. They all got involved in railroad as P did. None of them ever worked. Uh, they all got involved in cotton trading none of them worked, uh, but he stayed there and he became a Republican. He liked me and he did not like the savagery of the reconstruction and the redemption seeking Confederates, former Confederates. Uh, and he was supportive of my administration, particularly when I ran for the presidency. He was a, a campaign chairman for me when I ran for the presidency. And becoming a, a Republican was bad enough with his former uh, comrades in arms, but then he supported me for the presidency. That, that was even worse. And uh, after General Lee died, uh, the second anniversary of Lee's death, Jubal Early made a speech at Washington and now Lee University and lambasted everything about Pete Longstreet with the shine on his buttons. He said that Longstreet was personally responsible for the loss at Gettysburg and therefore personally responsible for the loss of the Confederacy to the Union. Uh, and other generals began to chime in. And as they're doing this, he's becoming ever more supportive of me. I made him the director of the surveyor of customs in the Port of New Orleans, which was a really well-paying job. And he prospered by now. He's got several more children. Oh, and I need to say, in February of 62, he got word that all four of his, at that time, children were sick with scarlet fever. He got back home as soon as he could from the field, and three of his children died in six days. Three, a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and an 11-year-old died within six days. Uh, and his fourth one, nearly died, but he, he recovered. And Longstreet and his wife planned the funerals, but they did not attend either the funerals or the burials. Uh, but back to after the war, when Longstreet got the surveyor of customs job that I gave him as president, uh, he also joined the Louisiana State Militia, which will, and became a major general in the Louisiana State Militia. Uh, and that was the command of all militias in the state of Louisiana, because the capital of Louisiana was in New Orleans at that time, and uh, also commanding all the police departments in New Orleans. Well, in uh, September of 1874, the, the White League uh, in New Orleans was determined to overthrow the government of Louisiana and install a redemption seeking control again of the Confederacy of the South, uh, they were going to uh, overthrow the government. Longstreet had some 1,500 USCT and all of them armed, and he had two Gatling guns and, in fact, some artillery. And as 8,400 White League men are marching toward his 3,500, mainly black troops, they, uh, he was at the head of his troops. The White League uh, rushed him, pulled him off his horse. Somebody shot him, but it was with a spent bullet. It was a weak, apparently, thankfully, a weak charge because it did not penetrate the skin. But they pulled him off his horse, shot him, and held him prisoner for two days before they finally threw him out, told him to go back where he, well, they actually told him two or three places he could go, but ultimately he went back home. And uh, he... And shortly after that, in 1875, 
he removed his family. By now, he's got six more children. His wife, Louise, ultimately gave birth to 10 children. And they moved to Augusta, Georgia, where he maintained his home and a plantation there. He, uh, for uh, from Jan December of 81 to June of 82, he was our United States ambassador to uh, Germany, Austria, to Austria. He, uh, in 1881 to 1884, he was appointed the United States Marshal for Northern Georgia, uh, another very nice job, until Grover Cleveland came in in 1885, a Democrat, and he cleaned house, and uh, Longstreet is out of work again. At that time, he began to write his memoirs from Manassas to Appomattox to defend himself from all of these attacks because he was being held up as the pariah of the Civil War and the, the villain of the lost cause. In fact, they were at that time blaming him for the loss of the entire war. Uh, and he wrote his memoirs. In, 18, in the May of 1889, his house burned down, burned to the ground, destroyed everything he had, including all of his personal papers and all of his journals. There were uh, one individual said you could count on one hand the number of personal papers from General Longstreet that survived. And then in uh, September of 89, just three or four months later, his wife of 42 years, Louise, suddenly died. Uh, he was bereft. And, and stayed around the house, gradually regained itself. And in 17, uh, 1897, eight years later, at age 76, he married Helen Dorch, who was 42 years younger than he, in the governor's mansion in Atlanta. And uh, they began a life together. Uh, and in January, January the 2nd, of 192, he was suddenly taken ill and died just six days short of his 84th birthday. And his wife, Helen, lived for another 58 years. She died in 1962. And uh, in fact, was Rosie the Riveter in an aircraft plant during World War II. Spunky lady. So, that is what I have to say about James Longstreet. Uh, I could say much more, but I urge you to, to see for yourself and read about the man and study him. He was a great military mind, uh, a, a tremendous uh, leader, a ferocious fighter, a worthy opponent on the battlefield. And uh, if generally, if is a big word, and I do not indulge in conjecture, but one has to wonder, if General Lee had listened to Longstreet at Gettysburg, would things have been different? But conjecture is a parlor game played by adults who have no stake in the outcome about that which they are conjecturing. It's very safe to do so. So that's all I have to say at this time about General Longstreet, one of the peripheral people in my life. I should be happy to handle any questions that you may have.